It's not enough to be right. After many years working on the climate change issue, it's clear to me that it's not enough to be right. It's not enough to be in command of the facts. It's not enough to have the best graphs. It's not even enough to have the most beautiful model of how we're going to create wealth from investing in natural systems. So if you are, as I am, concerned to be a part of a great transformation, it seems to me that you need three things, and you need them to relate to each other, and you need to expend energy putting those parts together. And they are love, reason, and power. And I mention that really to try and help us focus on the language that's required to make a transformation. The language and the relationships that go with that language. That's what defines our humanity. That's what we have as a species. We have language. And we are not anything as individuals either. We are only who we are through relationships. So if we're going to make a transformation in the society in which we live, we have to focus on those relationships and what moves people. A lot of our language is to do with value and values. It's to do with connecting words to actions that we think will be effective at delivering these outcomes that we crave. And I think we do crave them. I think one of the reasons why landscape is quite a good word to frame our conversation, we've tried several over the years, this one happens to be working at the moment, is because you can visualise a landscape. You can hold in your head a landscape. You can look at it and you can imagine it changing. You can also use it to resonate with your own culture, your own sense of place. So language is critical in so many ways. Even the investment language, even in the world of hard facts, and we are going to get to the reason section, there is still such a thing as sentiment. We know how people move money for reasons that are not wholly rational, or who follow a lead. But even just returning to the landscape idea, each of us has a strong sense of home. Even try saying that to yourself. It, it resonates in your chest. In other languages, I don't know, find your, use your language to say home to yourself. If there's a meaning there that manifests itself. It, it, has, it stretches you. It makes you think about all sorts of things that are valuable to you. And too little of that is featured in our sometimes very dry conversations about degrees of warming, for example. We need to situate a lot of our discussions about this transformation in language that resonates with us. Think of what words work with you. So love of place is very important. It motivates action. It allows people to think of the future. Much of the climate change debate requires us to think generationally. I was in an event uh, not so long ago, I was shocked. Uh, I mean, after years of working on this, I'd never heard uh, the work, actually, our uh, esteemed former president was involved with it. Uh, London and the UK and China and India, and the scientific community have been trying to figure out how to add probabilities to some of the basic scenarios that the IPCC produces, much of which you'll be familiar with, of course. The business as usual scenario, which easily can be challenged, but it's one that we work with, has not in the past had any probabilities attached to it. You know, all the scenarios are considered to be equally possible. So a bunch of folk got together and tried to think through, and this will, this will be emerge in papers in, in, a few, in a few weeks' time, what were the probabilities associated with these scenarios. And the business as usual scenario, they thought, and this was very calmly written up on a, on a, on a board, had a 50% likelihood of taking us to seven degree warming in 100 years. Well, factor that into these conversations you're having. If, if that's business as usual, seven degrees in the space of a century, that is not sustainable for human civilization. That's a world of conflict and despair. And it's also in that time frame a world that we are already generationally connected to. You know, line yourself up with the generations around you. In that time frame, 
generations alive today, particularly as they're likely to live a bit longer, they are, they are in that scenario. They're living in that scenario. So it's useful for the purpose of making a transformation to find language that resonates with you, allows more than a rational connection to the nature of the problem. However, we need reason. We need to be really good at the numbers. We need really high quality data that you can also visualize and translate into decision making. And you need it in forms and methods of communication that are easy to access. Uh, not exclusively in the hands of an elite, but available to a farmer with a mobile phone in the middle of East Africa. So that, that world, which is largely, not exclusively, largely the world of investment, needs to have examples of rates of return, successful returns on investment in funds. Uh, it needs to have stories that can, can, can be communicated beyond an interest group that already cares. Right. So again, by way of emphasis, love, reason, and power. You need to combine those forces in order to make a transformation. The sceptical, amoral, careless investor needs to have a language that they can, that can resonate with them too, that does get put up on a chart, that is communicated to a colleague in a neighbouring uh, section of the business, and it's made comparable just because of the numbers. You know, I outperformed you. I don't care what you're working on, my section did better than yours. That's, that's part of the societal response uh, that we need. And as we're finding, there are, there are examples of that. There are ways of looking at this transformation that are alluring to investors. Now, having said that, one of the things that we have to confront is that we are at a very early stage of that transformation in investment. Uh, our language is still bedeviled with irrelevances. We still don't really accommodate the real world fact of climate change. I mean, how many conversations have you had with people who perhaps don't occupy these rooms who think that climate change is something other, something else, something in the future? Something that isn't affecting rates of return now? Well, that's not the same thing as saying it's not real now. What it means is it's not been translated. You haven't developed the metrics that make what is real now into the language of investment risk and return. You haven't done that work, or you haven't dared in case it destroys value you've already invested in, which is why so much work is going on into the stranded asset uh, and unburnable <laughs> carbon space, because those are languages that do resonate with investors and fear of losing is a powerful motivator. And, and frankly, some of the analysis that's gone into the establishment of value in our investment system doesn't pass a reality check, given what we know is happening in our ecosystems. So one of the other things that I wanted to get across to you in this fantastic place is that if you want to have a sense of encouragement and purpose that this transformation is possible, it is useful to connect to the science of the brain that we now comprehend. There's a good unity now between long-standing philosophical uh, appreciations of how the world is formed in our minds with neuroscience today. It's quite easy in a way, I think, to say to you there is nothing real in the world of any value to any of us that we don't construct in our minds. So the idea that we can remake the world by reimagining is not such a large step. It doesn't look to be too far out in front of the horizon of possibilities. Because, because there is nothing else other than what we construct in our minds. So the perceptions, the judgments, the, the ways in which we can visualize a sustainable landscape, the way we can retrain our investor minds to look for returns that are in tune with those, those natural systems. They are all concepts that can be filtered and managed and, and changed inside our own minds. It's all perfectly possible for us to do that in our human society. And because of the risk, because of the, the threat that is so severe if we do not, 
my sense is that is going to encourage a great deal of creativity. Right? There will be constraint. There will be occasionally a sense of real fear and risk, security risk. There will be disruption, there will be cost that is difficult for people to bear. There will be suffering. Right? So those are all motivations, but so is the possibility of remaking the, the world that we live in. Another reason why I, I, I like the language of landscape, it can apply, of course, to urban landscapes, which we are constructing from scratch in many parts of the world. Landscape is also cultural. It's situated in cultures. It isn't the same everywhere. So there's an opportunity for the landscape idea to be diverse in itself, another strength in a world that needs to build resilience. So I offer that encouragement, but I, but I couple it with the idea that, that love, including, including the, the, if you like, the spiritual aspiration, that the, the, the humble approach towards loving all living things, which is a feature of, of many doctrines, and I find valuable, that that is not sufficient either. Love, reason, and power is required. So how do you organize, galvanize, direct power in pursuit of this transformation? Well, in the end, maybe a bias coming from my professional training, in the end, law carries that ideal. Law is a sense, it, it, it represents an ideal. Uh, the man who taught me law at, at Cambridge had a phrase that I've always liked, that I still think of, uh, that law is, a, is the will to perfection of a, of a society. There's something borrowed perhaps from Rousseau and, 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 and the general will, but, you, but I think you get a feel of what I mean there. That, that you write into your law, into your constitutions, into your legal doctrines, uh, the best expression of the self and the group that you wish to be, the society that you are. You write in that what you aspire to, how you wish to be for yourself and for others that you live in community with. So law is going to carry a lot of that work to direct and, and, uh, and manage the effort, the galvanizing of power. But of course, Marx would tell you, and probably quite accurately in this circumstance, that, that law is merely a political battle that someone has won and written down. Right? <laughs> so one has to think again of how, what is the language that you would wish to use to galvanize the forces that create the law, that creates the incentives and the, that can change the risk return profile of the investment because there is a specific incentive to conserve or to capture carbon or to value water. Right? All of that is going to be in your legal system. Okay? So again, one wants to think about how to transcend the rational arguments, the charts, the data, the risk and return stuff, to add to it the, the language that resonates with people, that moves people to act in their own interest, but also in the interest of the public good, and connect that to the processes by which uh, we make law. And I don't claim that law will always contain all of the interest, all of the time that are necessary for this transformation. Of course not, but one has to aim at that. And before I finish off, let me also suggest to you that, having had some experience now building enterprises, that I do feel that there are huge possibilities for combining the interests that you're talking about. I'll give you one example. I'm chairman of a company called Agrica, which owns a substantial property, 5,000 hectares in Tanzania. Uh, it's a rice and maize farm. Why is that interesting for our conversation after all this abstract thought? Well, think about what's involved with that. That enterprise was started here in London by people who had a very romantic and adventurous view about what was possible in Tanzania. It was based upon conservation work done there for many, many years by my friend Carter Coleman. He knew the land. It was based on a conversation we had in the early days of the formation of climate change capital about where undervalued assets were. Uh, challenging conversations with investors who want to know, well, where, where are you aiming all this capital? And I remember saying, I think water is undervalued. I think productive soil is undervalued. I think African agriculture is undervalued. And before I got into the sentence, my friend said, OK, well, let's start concentrating effort there. 
and we raised private capital, risk capital in London. It could not have been deployed without deep understanding of place in Tanzania and without strong political connections, because that's difficult to do. The land was bought. It took two years. There were some awkward moments in that purchasing process. In the end, although there was some misleading numbers on to how many smallholders were on the land, we agreed to regularise the position of the smallholders so they stayed on the land. We also agreed that we would bring finance, fertiliser and appropriate mechanisation to them for their use and we built businesses that they could use, they could draw on, they could lease the, technology, the equipment for example. Put those things together, they dramatically increased their yields. Now, I stood in the fields on smallholder land when the first harvest came in. And all those lads in their Barcelona shirts and their Manchester United shirts on little mini combine harvesters from Vietnam, going around this field with the, with the boss man standing there waiting to count the bags. And when those bags came in, they were two and a half times the yield from the year before, and I found that emotional. That was an emotional moment. He also, what really did me in as a father of daughters, is he said that the first thing he was going to do is send his daughter to school. Now, that, that, there's, there are numbers about there, there, there's, there are facts and figures and numbers about that investment, but it doesn't explain the whole story. That money that came from us to start with has been backed by Capricorn, a big private equity company that's really got its money from, from eBay fortune, but has a long-term vision about what private equity can do. Norfund, the big Norwegian... Um, aid fund that is an investor in these sort of transformations. And now um, Agdev Co. in the UK and, fingers crossed, in due course, OPIC from the US. USIID helped with the smallholder program, with the rice intensification program. It's now a big experiment. It's a great story, but it's eight years in and it's really hard work. It's really difficult to make a living from it. More capital will go in. It's completely sustainable from an energy point of view. And we use the rice husk, we have mini hydro, it will be a model from an energy point of view. Now, that story, that single story of investment tells you a lot of what you need to combine. And it does include all of these elements. And what I'm going to suggest to you is that if you want to picture in your own particular space how you make a transformation in sustainable land landscapes, you need all those elements. You need love, you need, you need reason, you need power, which I think I can call... Uh, the trinity of transformation, all those things. And I'll stop there and you can ask me questions.